time again for our meditational moment. As always, this is our quiet time. In case you don't get any other time, this is a time that we have reserved just to be our quiet time. A time when we can listen with our head and our hearts. Meditation is not easy, as most people know. It's very hard to clear your mind in a moment's notice. So to begin, let us get comfortable in our very own sanctuaries, right where you are. Our Father in Heaven will meet us more than halfway. And all you have to do is just sit there and just clear your mind. Let us take our first deep breath in. Hold it. And slowly release it. Another deep breath in. Hold it. And slowly release it. Meditation is a time when we get to listen to all of our thoughts. And because we are meditating at that moment, they all start coming together because there is a clarity to be gained from meditation. God sees what's on our mind and in our hearts, and he helps us to solve these problems that are burdening us or weighing us down. So that this way, we'll be able to function in a regular and normal way. So again, if we could take a nice deep breath in. Hold it. Slowly release it. Another deep breath in. Hold it. And slowly release it. We ask him, fill my cup in our hearts, in our minds. There's so much that we would love for him to take away from us during this time that we should not be burdened down with it. And all we have to do is just listen. Just listen. Just to clear our mind, open our hearts, and just relax. Let us take another deep breath in, hold it, and slowly release it. Let us take a couple of minutes just to sit quietly, because a lot of times this will help to clear our minds. So let us just sit quietly. At the same time that we're sitting quietly, let us continue to take those deep breaths in and out because they are so very important to do. So remember to breathe in, hold it, and slowly release it. Why time goes so fast when you're trying to work out a dilemma. But if you give all that you have and just release it and let it go, another deep breath in, hold it, and slowly release it. Another deep breath in. Hold it. Slowly, slowly release it. Wonderful. 
Let us take another deep breath in. Hold it and slowly release it. I hope that we've relaxed ourselves enough that we will take in whatever is given to us today, that we may just apply it in whatever way we feel that it needs to be applied to our lives. A final deep breath in. Hold it and slowly release it. Namaste. Namaste, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, it is a blessing to be here in this virtual sanctuary. Before I move forward, let me say happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers and mother figures uh, that are tuning in uh, to in this virtual sanctuary. We thank God for you. Let us pray. God, we just bless your name today. We thank you, God, for life. Thank you for the portion of health and strength that is ours. And that in, as we gather into this virtual sanctuary, we ask that you be with us, even as we celebrate mothers and motherhood, as we seek to strengthen and to comfort each other, wherever we may be on this day, emotionally and even physically. We ask now, God, that your Holy Spirit guide and direct uh, this worship experience so that wherever we may be today, we might be built up, edified, and together we might give your name glory and honor. In the mighty name of Jesus the Christ, we thank you and pray. Amen. Be blessed by this praise and worship selection by Brother Douglas Charles. Praise the Lord, everybody. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. We celebrate you. We love you so much. Hallelujah. But how many know we call the Lord faithful? I call you faithful. Your name is faithful. You are so faithful to me. I call you faithful. Your name is faithful. Faithful you are. And faithful you be. Oh, can I say that again? I call you faithful. Your name is faithful. You are so faithful to me. I call you faithful. Your name is faithful. Faithful you are. Oh, you be. Oh, I call you holy. Your name is holy. You are so holy to me. I call you holy. Your name is holy. Holy you are. You'll be, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 I call you holy. Your name is holy. You are so holy to me. I call you holy. Your name is holy. Holy you are and holy you be. We serve a holy God. Oh, I call you righteous. Your name is righteous. You are so righteous to me. I call you righteous. Your name is righteous. Righteous you are and righteous you be. Oh, come on and look 
your hand in here. One more time. I call you righteous. I call you righteous. Your name is righteous. You are so righteous to me. I call you righteous. Your name is righteous. Righteous you are. And righteous you'll be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 my heart says yeah, my spirit says yeah, my soul says yeah, 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 my mind says yeah, my heart says yeah, my spirit says yeah, my soul says yeah, 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 yeah. I feel my heart with him. Oh, say yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Righteous you are. Righteous you are. Righteous you are. Righteous you are, righteous you are, holy you are, holy you are, faithful you are, faithful you are, holy you are, holy you are, holy you are, holy you are, my soul says yeah, my mind says yeah. To your will and to your way. My soul says yeah. My mind says yeah. My spirit says yeah. My soul says yeah. You're a faithful God. You're a loving God. You're a righteous God. You're a mighty God. You're a holy God. We are thankful and grateful to God for. Uh, Brother Douglas Charles and a wonderful music ministry that God allows him uh, to execute again and again to the glory of God. It's preaching time and I am thankful and grateful to God uh, that the Lord pressed upon my heart on this, on this particular Mother's Day um, to share space, to make space uh, for you, Mount Airy. We've shared uh, that we are the best uh, on Frank Street and we deserve to hear the best wherever the best may be found. I'm thankful and I'm grateful to God that on this day you will be blessed by a great woman of God in the person of the Reverend Dr. Uh, Cynthia Diaz. Uh, she is a powerful woman of God. God uh, uh, called her from the bench, literally uh, the judicial bench, as she was historic figure uh, in the legal profession uh, in Long Island, New York. And then the Lord called her to engage in ministry full time, where she combined both her law experience and judgeship experience uh, with the gospel of Jesus the Christ, blessing people uh, the length and breadth of this land. I'm thankful that several years ago, I had the blessed privilege of meeting her uh, while engaged in relationship with a clergy group, clergy and pastor group, uh, led and facilitated by our dear sister, uh, Pastor Carol Steptoe. Uh, and we had a chance to connect and and uh, the Lord has blessed our friendship over the years. She has been here at Mount Airy enjoying uh, Ma'afa and other experiences that we've had here at Mount Airy. And I'm thankful and grateful that in the midst of all of her other ministerial uh, uh, duties, she is proud to be the founding pastor of the International House of Hope and Healing. Uh, and she'll share a little bit more about that but I'm thankful and grateful that on this day, on this Mother's Day, we're going to be blessed by a mighty word by our dear sister. Uh, we ask that you would pray 
for our sister as she comes and brings the word of God on today to the glory of God. Hear ye her. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Peace and blessings, Mount Airy Baptist. Giving all honor and praise to God on this day, we are reminded, we are compelled to honor the women who have nurtured, who have raised, who have loved us every single day of the year and of our lives, not only on this highly commercialized Mother's Day, but on every day. I bring greetings from the International House of Hope and Healing Ministries, where I proudly serve as the founder and as the senior pastor. And as I bring those greetings, I bring greetings from my faith community, and I bring heartfelt appreciation for your pastor, who has been a friend and a mentor, and for your dynamic first lady. Uh, just to share with you, one year ago, when God called me to launch a virtual ministry in the beginning days of this awful pandemic, uh, it was during a time when my firstborn son was on a COVID brink between life and death. And in the midst of all of that, God called me and I heard clearly to begin the House of the International House of Hope and Healing. And when, when that was made clear to me, I reached out to your pastor who graciously agreed to serve as my spiritual covering and as my chief ministerial accountability uh, partner. And he has done just that. And for that, I am thankful. Pastor Bennett's covering has led to the birth and growth of a non-denominational authentic community that continues to transform spiritually. And in addition to that, we were honored and blessed to have him as one of our Boys to Men guest preachers during our first year. Uh, so I have a double and triple blessing, not only to have uh, your pastor and first lady journey with me, but I with you. So I was so, um, so moved and honored to accept his invitation to be your Mother's Day preacher. Amen. So today, as I virtually appear before you, uh, by way of uh, disclosure, I am a bilingual, bicultural, Afro-Cuban, Puerto Rican woman of God. I am speaking and preaching to you from Elmont, New York, which is located on the eastern shore of Long Island. And I find myself in this moment delivering a message to you, Mount Airy Baptist, located in Bridgeport, Connecticut. It is clear that we come from different places, having done different things, and we find ourselves in different locations as we meet virtually. But there is one thing that we all critically share uh, and have in common with one another. Every single one of us, from the most seasoned to the youngest, from the, the east to the west, from the north to the south, from the richest to the poorest, from the saved to the unsaved, from the happiest to the saddest, from the tallest to the shortest, from, to, from the seen to the unseen, from the known to the unknown, from the loudest to the quietest. We all share one indisputable, undeniable thing in common every single one of us without exception, whether we are firstborn or lastborn, planned or unplanned, whether we were loved or unloved, whether we were adopted or in foster care, whether our lives began in a test tube, the backseat of a car, or in a drug infested alley, whether we were raised on the highest, most majestic mountain, or whether we were abandoned and uncared for in the deepest pit of a neglected and malnourished valley, it doesn't matter where we began, every one of us without a single exception were formed and shaped in one woman's womb before we entered this universe, a universe that was handcrafted by our creator. More importantly, according to the weeping prophet Jeremiah, God knew each and every one of us before we were shaped in our mother's wombs. Amen. Given the common thread 
the common experience of being hatched and delivered from one woman's womb that we all share, the Holy Spirit has led me to strengthen the memory of that initial cord that gave us life with an additional layer of acknowledgement of the multiple other threads from all of the other women that make up the quilts of our lives in a message entitled, The Wombs of Our Destiny. The scripture I believe that describes not only what it's like to be a desirable wife, but more significantly, what it means to be a woman of noble character can be found in a familiar passage in the wisdom and guidance of Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31. If I could just read this passage into our hearing and get it deep in our spirits as we unpack this message in honor of the women in our lives. It's an epilogue and it describes the wife of noble character and uh, in my estimation, it, it generally describes the nobility of the women in our lives. The word reads, a wife of noble character, who can find? She is far worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it out of her earnings and she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city God gate. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let me just share something with you for the next few minutes. When I think about all the noble women beyond my mother's, my mother who sewed into the fabric that is described as my life, I think of the many roles that each one of those women have consistently played in my growth and in my continued development, even in this late season in my life. I think about their wisdom. I am encouraged by their strength in the best and in the worst of times. I, I think about their worth that far outweighs the diamonds and pearls that many of them have never possessed. I remember smiles that lit up dark rooms in, in times of loss and trouble. I, 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 I can still smell, and I remember, uh, and I think about the smell of hot cones, Jergens lotion, I might lose some young folks here, Jean Nate, rice and beans, arroz con pollo, arroz con gandulas, roast pork, fenil, bacalao, even Vicks vapor rub, and so many other sights and smells that all raise the images and the memories of the women of my past and the present 
who have poured into my life. Each one of us have a personal memory bank of nourishing sights and sounds and smells attached to the women who have mothered our existence. I invite each and, each and every one of you to pause just for a moment and reflect on all of the ways that the wounds of your destiny have demonstrated their dedication to serving each one of us while serving so many others, for that's what wounds do. As we read today's text, think about the ways that these women have loved and cared for their husbands and their mates while raising the children that came from their wounds and oftentimes nurturing children from their families and known and unknown communities outside of their household. Today, and prayerfully every day, we pause to acknowledge and celebrate the ways that Proverbs 31 women in our lives take care of folks inside and outside of their homes, whether they are fortunate enough to treat whatever servants they may be blessed to have or with compassion or supervise those who work under them with those who have positions in high places. I just stopped by Bridgeport, Connecticut to share our blessings and express heartfelt appreciation for the women called by God to serve not only us, but simultaneously, especially in a time like this, those who are serving the poor and the needy while taking care of their families and their homes. On this day that we woke up, on this day, the Bible tells us to be glad and to rejoice in it. This day that has never seen, been seen before, I just want to talk about our maternal figureheads. Let's just celebrate, hold up, think about, pray about. Remember, our mothers, our sisters, our biological and adopted aunties, our older cousins, our godmothers, our church mothers, the women who we may have never met, but their service and dedication has given us needed oxygen and strength to do the work that God has called us to do. Today, we are honoring all of our self-appointed surrogates who willingly provided needed spaces for our continued growth after we exited our mother's wounds. To God be the glory for the wounds who have sacrificially and lovingly prayed for us, molding and shaping our dreams, altering the course of our destinies in alignment with altering and, and altering the course of our desires, rather, in alignment with our divine destinies. In an era when women represent the large portion of the workforce, I thank God for women in leadership who are out there on the front lines, as I have been for many years. But I also admire and I lift up every woman, every mother, who was a stay-at-home mom, every woman who never went or worked a day in her life, and yet her contributions, the job and the task that she performed were so, so incredibly needed and essential to all of the work that we are all called to do. What would we have done without the women who never earned a college degree? a position or a title, the women in the church, for instance, whose fried chicken dinners, macaroni and cheese, collard greens before we got healthier, fried platanos, peach cobblers, and arroz con dulce supplied the majority of the money needed for our church building funds. The women who pour out their gifts and their talents, given the best of what they have, the women who are caretakers, the women who or, or, or health care providers, the women who take care of the elderly, the women who baby and nurse our children so we can go out to work. Lord, we just want to thank you for women all around the world who have loved and cared for us with eagerness, resilience, and priceless resourcefulness. I am also praising the women who go out and have made enough money to purchase the bacon and they have not forgotten how to joyfully continue frying it up in a pan. For we are women of many talents who can multitask in many ways. 
for this sacred time that we are spending together. I am, I want to open up the door for us to individually and collectively focus on the precious, noble, life-sustaining wounds who have done all that they could do and were able to do in the ways and the places that they could with never feeling hindered or demeaned by serving others. Because those noble women, first and foremost, they are generally women who, are the, the, who we are honoring today were also and are also women who serve God, who believe in the God, the creator of everything and everyone in it, who believe that their purpose and their mission is to serve God by serving others. On this day, as we direct our hearts, our minds, and our spirits of gratitude to these women who have birthed different parts of us through their love and service, as we lift up and we give badges of merit to the army of wise women who have served on the battlefields of our lives, who, who are fulfilled by serving others because they understand that in their battles, godly service is without question the source of their true nobility. And it is because of that they are worthy to be acknowledged and worthy of our praise. Now, Ari, I know who you are. I have worshiped in your sanctuary. I have been the beneficiary of your love and your prayers. I have dried my tears during my offer, and I have experienced the healing presence of your first lady, Donna Bennett. This is a sacred place where the ways of God, the word of God and the will of God are all working together. On this Mother's Day, let us feast on the living word of God for the people of God that is found not only in the wisdom text of Proverbs in chapter 31, but in so many other chapters of the Bible. Prayerfully, let us incline our ears and listen to King Lemuel in Proverbs 31 as he speaks to his son while he shared an inspired utterance based upon the lessons that his mother taught him. Catch this, here is a king who could have relied on any other passage from any other source, who had access to whatever words of wisdom he needed to impart either from his personal experience or from his vast catalogs and, and resources that he had at his fingertips as a king. And yet he sits his son down and it is his choice, it is his intention, it is his desire to share the pearls of wisdom that his mother taught him. And they, so I want you to incline your ears and I ask, can you hear this king, king's mother telling her son, the king, listen my son, son of my womb, that's found in the beginning of, of Proverbs 31. She says, listen, son, to the answer to my prayers. Amen. Does that utterance sound familiar to you? When we prayed the song, somebody prayed for me, we know how many mothers have prayed for their sons and daughters. Who, who was the woman in your life who sat you down and said, listen, my daughter, listen, my son, let me tell you how and when my prayers for you have been answered. Who was that woman in your life? Today, I believe that this text is calling us as sons and daughters to listen to these words from Proverbs 31, to remember the words of inspiration that have been lovingly and sometimes sternly spoken into our lives. I want to tell you by way of, of revelation and transparency, my mother never minced her words. She, she was unapologetic in the rules that she set forth for me and the expectations that she demanded. Amen. <laughs> she did not play. Today, we are all being called to honor the wounds that have blessed our souls in whatever form and whatever fashion. Those women who blessed our lives as God continued to chart, charter our paths and the Holy Spirit continues to lead us in the right direction 
leading us, guiding us, directing us, and whenever and wherever we fall short, correcting us. Let us continue praying that God may, may open our eyes so that each and every one of us might see what God wants us to see, no matter what we have been looking at with our natural eyes. Lord, help us. Incline our ears so that we might hear your voice, Lord, above and beyond all other voices. God, touch our hearts so that we may feel your love and lift our hands so that we might hold on to your unchanging hand as we follow the path set aside for each one of us in accordance with your divine will for our lives. Truth be told, all of our destinies are nourished by multiple giving wounds that have been interwoven into our lives and our journeys on this side of eternity. Think about this for a moment. Sometimes the threads of the different women in our lives begin to unravel in unexpected ways at unforeseen moments. Has this ever happened to you? where you're just going along and then all of a sudden stuff just starts falling apart. Sometimes it's early in the morning for me or in the middle of the, uh, the afternoon, while other times memories of my past sneak up on me at the midnight hour. For example, as I come before you today, 65 years young, when God has been blessing me with the dawn of a new day and my hips and knees begin speaking to me before I'm able to rise, I hear the voices from my youth that I didn't quite understand when I was young. Did you ever hear any of your elders talking about Arthur when they woke up in the morning? Some of you are familiar with that seasoned announcement that would let you know that Arthur was acting up again. I could remember so many women in my life, life talking about Arthur and I used to wonder who, what, and where was this Arthur who seemed to occupy daily space in all of the bedrooms of my elder women. Well, now I know who Arthur, <laughs> who Arthur is up close and personal. Please don't ask me how Arthur shows up at my house every day. How about, when I complete my third or fourth trip to the bathroom, young folks don't know about this, late at night, and I have an opportunity to catch a glimpse of myself in the hours between midnight and the break of dawn, I am increasingly shocked to see the reflection of my loud talking, cussing and fussing, never want to be like her great aunt's image staring back at me from the mirror. Woo! When this first started happening, this was an image that I did not want to see or look like. Not because she was unattractive, because she was quite beautiful, but because I was not fond of her spirit and the way that, that she chose to cuss folks out in Spanish and in English. Amen. As the current me now, as the current leader of the next generation of elders in my family, now... I can see beyond my feisty great aunt's surface who had was laid to rest many years ago. In this season of my life, I can now clearly see what was laying beneath the, the surface. I can see her pain. I can, I can feel her disappointments. I, I can tap into her insecurities and the unhappiness that was masked and oftentimes unseen by others because they were only hearing what she was saying and not knowing and feeling what she had actually been through. When I look in the mirror in the darkness of the night, I can now see my great aunt's beauty behind her mask, all of her beauty, not just her physical beauty, but her spiritual strength, her mental strength. When I turn on the light that is powered and generated by God, I can now see the strength in my Titi Faustina's survival. That young woman, that young brown skinned, skinned Spanish speaking only young woman who came to this country from port, on a boat from Puerto Rico. That young woman who came seeking a better life, like so many 
of the immigrants who are crossing the border today, like so many who are arriving not on planes, not on boats, but walking for miles and miles, seeking a better life, seeking the opportunities and the dream that is supposed to exist here in America. Well, my aunt arrived looking for the same thing early, early, back in the early 30s, late 20s. And she found herself married to a white Italian immigrant who only spoke his native tongue in Italian. Neither one of them <clears throat> spoke English, but somehow the language of their love and lovemaking produced two daughters who looked like their father with no obvious tint or trace of their African looking mother. Amen. Whew. Wow. I can now see what it must have been like for her to give birth to two daughters who had their father's pigmentation. Two daughters, one with curly red hair and the other one with straight light brown hair, while my aunt wrestled with the heat and the stench of a hot comb trying to press out the kinks in her head in the 1930s when she was left when she was left alone by her Italian husband to raise her daughters at the height of the depression in Brooklyn, New York. Can you imagine what it must have been like? What it must have been like to be a mother who looked like her daughter's servant in the eyes of those who did not know her? Can you imagine what it was like to be left with a DNA reminder of a boat that was no longer sailing in her port when her husband left her and never ever returned again? It was in a Holy Spirit moment of enlightenment that I finally began to appreciate the wisdom and blessings that my grandmother's youngest sister was seeking in her own way to impart through her colorful language. I discovered the nobility in her sacrifices in the many ways that although our stories and our lives drastically differed from the course that my life took and the benefits and the, and the opportunities that I had versus hers, that although the course of our destinies differed, that there are chapters in my journey that I have that have been molded and shaped by her strength and by her survival. No, I did not have an interracial marriage. No, I didn't have the experiences that she had. But yet, I saw the resilience that she had and now understand firsthand what she was imparting to each and every one of us. We all have folks who have left their foot, their hand, and their heart prints on our lives. Pay attention when they start showing up in the mirrors of our lives, amen? Ask, ask yourself, what is God trying to show you? What is God trying to show us with their appearance or through their lack of appreciation, the lack of appreciation that we have for them for their presence in our lives? What's God trying to show us in that? This is often the case with our ancestors and with the blessings that we pass on to our children. We try to pick and choose which ancestors we're gonna share their stories. But the reality is that everybody's story is important. Everybody's story has value. Our prayer should be that the generations that follow us will avoid our pitfalls because we have already charted a course that hopefully will favorably alter their destiny. But the truth of the matter is that the more things change, the more they remain the same, that things have a way of repeating themselves over and over again. And that's why it's so important to know where we're going. We must know and hold on to where we've been, what has come before us. I suggest that each and every one of us begin to closely examine ourselves. Let us take a look in the mirror and look beyond the image that is staring back at us. Ask yourself, who do I look like? What's showing up? 
in my DNA? What's showing up in my member? What positive and negative past and present experiences and relationships have shaped and molded my life? Where have I, have I drawn my lessons from, consciously or unconsciously? We are walking, talking, Ancestry.com representatives, whether we know our ancestors' stories or not. They creep up and they show up in silent and sometimes loud ways, in seen and unseen ways, in known and unknown circumstances. In recent years, every time my flight lands in Florida I, and I step off the plane, my younger brother's eyes are filled with tears because he sees the image of our deceased mother instead of seeing me. Who do you look like? Where's your DNA plane landing these days? Whenever I fall in love, as another example, or I am filled with love for, for others, I smell the aroma of my Puerto Rican grandmother, mi abuelita Margarita. For me, she defined love. For me, she was the foundation of everything I know and have learned about love. For me, she, is, she was the epitome of unconditional love. For me, love is shape has been defined and smells like real love, true love, is defined and smells like my maternal grandmother, the light of my life. I, I feel the joy of unconditional love whenever I see her in my spirit, sauteing fresh garlic, onions, green peppers, cilantro, and savory Latin spice spices in a huge black cast iron pot, large enough to feed my mind, my body, and my soul. When we think about the virtuous women in our lives, so often our memories are flooded with the aroma of their cooking, the smell of their perfume or liniment, the sound of their voices, the sway of their hips, the sweat on their brows, or the salt <laughs> of their unseen and hidden tears. Whenever I find myself in contrast, in my body, uh, but mentally, emotionally, or socially distanced from others, feeling a different kind of way, I then feel the threads connected not to my maternal grandmother, but to my paternal Cuban grandmother, whose warmth never seemed to reach their, her eyes. That's an uncomfortable feeling for me, much like when I look in the mirror and I used to look at my great aunt's image, I don't want to be that person that I perceive see my grandmother Maria to be. She, 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 she was a woman who I was not very fond of, didn't know quite as well as the Puerto Rican side of my family, because I knew that she disliked my mother. My mother and father were divorced when I was only five years old. So instead of warmth and love, I remember her coldly sitting across from me, her firstborn granddaughter, without a hint of joy or fondness for me that I experienced everywhere else. Her countenance, the distant look on her face, and her spirit was the total opposite of the community of women who were raising me day by day. From childhood to adulthood, I had been dressed and bathed in a community of light and love that was being consistently stretched, stitched by my matriarchal quilt of wombs who celebrated and loved me unconditionally every day of my life. But that's not what I found across town at Grandma Maria's house, Abuela Maria. Once again, the Holy Spirit had to come upon me and show me some things about not leaning to my limited understanding about my father's mother, who I really knew so little about. Stay prepared. The Holy Spirit may have to show each and every one of you a thing or two about some folks in your family. Amen. My paternal grandmother's spirit showed me and reminded me, arrived in New York on a different kind of boat than my mother's mother. My mother's mother voluntarily came at 16 on a boat from Puerto Rico and, and she was filled with anxiousness, but she wanted to come to this country. In contrast, my paternal grandmother fled from Cuba shortly before Castro 
Rose Regine when she saw and felt the handwriting on the wall. It wasn't necessarily a voluntary departure. She felt like she had no choice. She felt like this is the place that she needed to raise her children. After a couple of personal trips to Cuba, I now understand that apparently there was more to my grandmother's sour look than what was on the surface. I began to realize that maybe her look of displeasure, maybe her unhappiness, maybe her 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 just inability to just exhibit and exude joy was more than just how she felt about my mother and her, uh, her story and her relationship with my father. Maybe there was more to her story because there is always a story behind everybody's story. Every time I had questioned why this Cuban grandmother couldn't be like my Puerto Rican grandmother, why she couldn't be like my salsa loving dancing mother or any of my biological and lovingly designated aunties, I was not searching when I asked those questions or receiving the right answers. My young inquiring mind wanted to know why this grandmother couldn't laugh and smile like the wide array of my appointed and self-designated godmothers and women in my, life, in my life. I was trying to place her in a box to fit my perception of who I thought she should be like without considering what her story was. I'm talking about my story, but I'm really talking about all of our stories. There's somebody somewhere who we've mischaracterized. There's somewhere, somebody somewhere that we've misjudged. There's somebody somewhere whose story we have not taken into full account. I thought to myself, clearly, this grandmother who never crossed my mother's threshold uh, had nothing in, of value in common with all of the other women I knew. I felt that because she lived in a brownstone on the other side of the Bronx, that she didn't know anything about the women who sat on the project benches, single women, who divorced women, women who had never ha really had a full-time mate, who were doing the best they can to raise their children. I felt like my grandmother was disconnected from all of that and that perhaps she felt like she was better than them. I felt like she didn't know anything about the pain and the stories that I heard and eavesdrop on while sitting on those benches. I, I thought that she didn't understand the struggles of single parenting because she had a full-time husband at home. I asked myself, how could she possibly be my grandmother? How could she possibly relate to my existence growing up in housing projects in the Bronx? Have you ever asked yourself questions about your kinfolk? Have you ever wanted to cut some folks out of your family tree without discovering the roots of their origins or their existence? What is fascinating is that despite this grandmother's frigid appearance on the outside, <laughs> her warm blood was running through my veins on the inside and there was nothing I could do about it, such is the case with all of our relatives. What is of greater significance is that as a child, I had not paid attention or was not even conscious of the fact that this woman who never smiled or laughed had to leave the home of her rich inheritance in Cuba, seeking a political asylum in America, a land that painted all Latinos with one brush that did not apply, she felt, to her original landscape to the land of paradise that she had left behind. Consequently, once she was displaced from her warm tropical climate, her demeanor apparently became as cold as the climate that she met when she arrived in New York, the place that she had been forced to flee to. What my young eyes had missed was the pain that she took to her grave when her firstborn son who had served voluntarily and honorably in the United States Armed Forces had been deported back to Cuba with no further ability to ever see, his, to see her or his family again until I visited Cuba in the 1990s. And until he died a few years ago, he had any contact with anybody else besides myself. Because in the late, late 50s, his parents lacked the knowledge and the ability to retain 
appropriate legal representation to keep him from being deported to Cuba from the United States. And he was deported and was never seen on these shores again. It is important for all of us to unpack the stories behind the stories in our families and intimate relationships. Folks, every one of us have a story. So today, as we celebrate Mother's Day, let us ask ourselves, what is our family story? Who are the good, the bad, and the ugly players on each, in each scene of our lives? Are there missing pages in our life scripts? or loose threads that have begun to unravel as we weave all of the different patches of our journey together. This Sunday, my, my prayer for each and every one of us as we honor our, the women in our lives and as we honor God is that this Sunday, that yes, we honor those women that we love to love, but that we also go out and buy some roses for the woman or the women we have a broken or fragmented relationship with. The women we have not understood. The women that we don't know, we know very little about because we're basing it on past history. The women, whether she is our mother or not, who we have not spoken to in a long period of time because we are angry about something they said, didn't say, did, or failed to do. Let us pick up the phone and call those women who we have been in disagreement with. Let us reach out to those women who have hurt us, who have disappointed us. Let us reread Proverbs 31 and visualize the gifts and the talents of each and every woman in our lives let us be grateful for each and every womb that has been called by God to shape our destinies. Oh, saints, let us put on our armor of forgiveness and think long and hard about whether we have ever misjudged the women who God has assigned and placed in our lives. Today's message is uncomplicated. It is simple. We can't pick and choose who, when, and how God sends some wanted and some unwanted folks into our lives. We can't pick and choose our family, but we can choose to remember that we are all part of God's family, woven together with a universal thread that should be interwoven with forgiveness. Preacher, what are you trying to tell us today? Is this your memoir or is this a sermon? How is this Proverbs 31 scripture connected to the message today and to our lives, Pastor? These are all good questions, my sisters and brothers. And the answer is that it is a simply a message of hope and healing based upon the noble character of not some, but of all of the women in our lives who play different roles in different places, in different times, in different ways. Whether that woman is a college president or a high school dropout, whether that woman is a physician or a crackhead strung out on crack or any other drug of choice, whether that woman is a very successful lawyer or doing life in prison, this message is about God who has never left any of us or forsaken us and we should not do, and we should do the same one with another. Even when we have ne never experienced a biological mother or grandmother's love, we should not be forsake the women who God has placed in our lives. The scriptural text for our guidance and understanding can be found in the lives and contributions of all of the named and unnamed women of the Bible who had such a significant impact on salvation history that their voices and their assign assignments could not be silenced even when we couldn't hear it. The applicable scriptural text can be found in the lives and contributions of all of those unnamed and unnamed women who have been with us from day one, who have been part of our spiritual journey, who have been part of the message that God has crafted to guide us along the way. This message is about the neighborhood Miss Marys and the Miss Hatties who taught us the biblical principle of feeding the multitudes by always feeding us, feeding members of the community, neighbors and friends and family when we were hungry. The women who consistently showed us how to make a way out of no way, how to make lemonade out of the slew of lemons that came their way, always sharing what they had even when they barely had enough 
to feed themselves or their households. I'm talking about the wounds of our destiny. I'm talking about the, our female warriors and ancestors from the shores of Africa, whose wounds landed in different parts of the Caribbean, throughout the West Indies, and in far and distant points of Latin America, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Dominican Republic. Today's tribute is about our foremothers who survived the Middle Passage, barely breathing, but still living when the bowels of slave ships expelled them onto a land that was ready, willing, and, and able to exploit their hard labor and their bodies as unwilling receptacles for the sperm banks of their slave masters. Pastor Bennett, this message is about every woman everywhere who has fed our existence from the beginning of time, beginning with Eve in the garden, straight through the book of Revelation. It's about every woman who blessed her child by releasing them for adoption, or the women who turned to their family or friends, uh, or friends and placed them in their care when they did not have the means or the capacity to raise their children themselves. This message of appreciation is about First Lady Donna, who saw the light in Tuck at a young age. This message is about Mama and them, who may not have been able to remember all of our names, but always knew our spirits and fed our hearts. It's about our, our Harriet Tubmans, who have risked their lives for our freedom. It's about our civil rights activists, like Fannie Lou Hamer, who fought the good fight until she died from breast cancer. It's about the Rahabs, who some choose to describe as a lady of the night without acknowledging and, and celebrating the light of day and her critical role in salvation history. It's about our praying without ceasing Hannah's. It's about the widows left to raise their children, giving the best of the little that they have to God and receiving a hundredfold in return. It's about the women with issues who have been scorned, shamed, cast aside with no hope of healing, finding a cure, but they dared like the woman with the issue of blood to step out into the midst of uncaring and judgmental mean crowds where they finally were able to have an encounter with Jesus as they reached for the hem of his garment. Oh, this is about Trayvon Martin's mother whose voice is louder than all of the skittles that fell on the ground alongside the blood that her son wrongfully shed. Oh, we pause to reach out to Breonna Taylor's mother and George Floyd's mother who will never stop hearing and feeling her son call for her assistance until a knee that was not bent in prayer took George's last breath away, breathing new life into a movement for justice. It's about Black Lives Matter. It's about Our Lives Matter. It's about somebody here today truly understanding that this message of hope intertwined with our healing is highlighted and magnified by a young teenage virgin named Mary, chosen by God to be the womb to deliver Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, into the world, and her cousin Elizabeth, who like some of us was filled with faith despite her unfulfilled barren womb for many years until God chose her womb to shape her destiny, to shape our destiny with John the Baptist who would die before Jesus was crucified on the cross for you and for me. Oh, today we salute the mother of every son and daughter who is faced with lifetime without parole or who is facing death on death's row as our destinies continue to be reshaped through our nation's need for prison reform. On this day, we vow to help out the mama of the son and or daughter who is sitting in a county jail or local jail because an entire family and village ha has not been able to raise $500 or less for bail for their legal fees. Uh, or this is a lifetime tribute for the women who sold cakes and pies and walked a thousand miles to send us to college. This is my personal message of gratitude for the mother of God, Mary, whose statue sat in the garden of the Catholic church where I was raised. Thank you, Mother Mary, for hearing my cries when the doors of the Catholic church were slammed shut on my young mama who could not attend service on Sunday because she had a, an X, a red X on her back. She could not 
received communion. She was prohibited from receiving the host, the body and Christ and blood of Christ, because she had the audacity to seek divorce, freeing her from a marriage that was not part of her lifetime destiny. Oh, in closing, I thank God for every woman in our lives, women and men of God, this womb, the wombs of our destiny, and this message is all about you and all about me. It is underscored and it is highlighted by the ways of God, the word of God, and the will of God for our lives on this day and every day of our lives. May the Lord be with you, may the Lord keep you, and may we continue to celebrate every woman who crosses our path by whatever means necessary at whatever means and times of our lives. In this we pray, and this, the church, I invite you to say amen, amen, amen. God be with you. Vayan con Dios. Thank you. My, 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 I did not tell you that uh, she was a preaching woman. I'm thankful and grateful to God uh, for that mighty word and testimony. Love the way how she interwove her own testimony in the preached word of God. I thank God for uh, the Reverend Dr. Cynthia Diaz. Thank you, Mount Airy, uh, for all that uh, you have done to allow this ministry to go forth, to be a blessing to those uh, who are in need of the blessing. And I'm thankful for all the opportunities that God has afforded this ministry to continue to serve locally and beyond. We're going to ask that you now prepare your elements that we might commune together. Someone may ask, well, Pastor, how long are we going to do this communion every week? Will it not lose its uh, significance? And I say, as the scripture says, as oft as ye eat and drink, you do it in remembrance. And so we're remembering the sacrifice of Jesus as we ourselves are sacrificed, uh, separated, but together in the spirit. I'm going to ask now that we partake together to Jesus. The blood that will never ever lose its power to heal, to free us, to loose us from all that binds us and then to keep us in the love of Jesus, to Jesus. To the glory of God. Want to just lift up a few announcements. Uh, please continue to keep all the families that are experiencing bereavement in prayer. Brother Fred Beelan and the loss of his niece. I'm gonna ask that you also keep Zelda Freeman, Manya Payne, on the loss of the son and father, respectively. Service of celebration will take place this Friday at Morton's Mortuary. Brother James Freeman um, is the deceased. And so we're praying for the family. We want to thank God for each of you for your continuous contributions both your viewership and your financial contributions. Uh, certainly we know we continue to need them both. And so, and we ask that you would share with other people that they might uh, uh, pray about making both contribution by viewing as well as contribution financially to the forward movement of this ministry. This is May, we're well into May. Uh, we're going to ask that you are mindful of uh, the announcements, I'm not going to read them all, but I think there's some things you want to you want to know about as we prepare ourselves for the mighty uh, work in May. We want to be mindful that May 19th, um, the Reverend Dr. Frederick Jerome Streets, our predecessor here, uh, longtime pastor of the Mount Airy Baptist Church, uh, he will be in conversation with Pastor Kathy and I during our Wednesday Bible study, May 19th at 12 noon. On May the 22nd at 12 noon, 
we will have our prayer and praise in the parking lot in preparation for our celebration and for some of us, the regathering in this sanctuary on Sunday, May the 23rd at 9.30. People are asking, when are we regathering in the sanctuary? It will be May the 23rd at 9.30. Now we will continue to have this online uh, service. So brother, sister, if, if you're not comfortable coming back, no problem. Just continue to view at 9.30 uh, via Facebook Live and our website. Amen. And then on uh, Wednesday, again, May the 26th at 12 noon, we will continue our Bible study series uh, on caring for the caregivers. How do we take care of ourselves in the midst of taking care of others? And our very dear sister and friend, uh, the Dr. Teresa Allen, uh, will share with us insights. So please mark your calendar, check Facebook page, check our website. We also want to um, acknowledge that if you have uh, recognitions, report cards, and graduation announcements, we know there are a number, please email them to admin at mountairybaptist.org, admin at mountairybaptist.org. One graduate that we will uh, announce today, that Cortland Dix, after excelling in his academics and on the football program, he is graduating from Deerfield Academy in Massachusetts and was recruited by Brown University in Rhode Island for their football program on a scholarship. Congratulations, Cortland. We also want to acknowledge the retirement uh, of Burrow Kingston from DCF in, DCF in March. Again, Burrow Kingston retired from DCF in March, the Department of Children and Families. Listen, uh, I'm thankful for her retirement. Uh, maybe she have a little bit more time in the, for the church, um, but but no, sister, enjoy uh, your retirement. Enjoy it to the fullest. Amen. Amen. My brother, my sister, listen. We've had a time again. We want to thank uh, Sister Robin, Sister Liza, for a marvelous tribute to um, all the mother and mother figures in our lives. Last yesterday. Uh, we had a wonderful time, both in fellowship in our cars and, and the balloons that were sent uh, off, uh, symbolically remembering all the women and women figures in our lives. So thank them for doing what they did, and thank you for your continuous support of this ministry. To God be the glory. Until we meet again, come on and join us on this Wednesday. This Wednesday the 12th, we will uh, continue our exploration into the life of Joseph and how his life uh, can parallel uh, the journey that many of us might find ourselves on in the midst of this pandemic. And so please tune in with us, Pastor Kathy Williamson and myself. We will continue our Bible study journey, uh, digging into Genesis 37 through 50. Until then, God bless you and God keep you. Amen. Oh,